In our concluding lecture in addiction counseling techniques, we shift our focus to the vital aspects of clinical resiliency and preparing for impactful work in the addiction counseling field. Throughout this course, we've discussed essential topics like motivational interviewing techniques, exploring their efficacy in addressing substance use issues, and hot topics including navigating resistance, fostering a strong therapeutic alliance, and approaching confrontation in a trauma-informed way. While we've covered the intricacies of working with clients, today we address a critical topic, your own clinical resiliency. How do you stay whole and resilient in this demanding field? Many counselors grapple with challenges like imposter syndrome, burnout, vicarious trauma, and compassion fatigue. My aim in this lecture is to fill your resilience bank, keeping you optimistic and at your best to empower others on their journey to lead their best lives. So our first discussion question for today is what is your greatest fear or anticipated challenge in working with individuals with substance use disorders? Oftentimes our fears or anticipated challenges can get in the way of doing our best work and making connections with our clients. What might be in your way? At the heart of a robust client-centered therapeutic relationship lies empathetic understanding. As addiction counselors, empathy emerges as our most potent tool for fostering connection and trust with those seeking treatment. The ability to say, I see you and you are not alone, holds profound power. Acknowledging that we don't have all the answers, but committing to continuous listening and inquiry builds a bridge of connection. Many of us share this experience, the ability to connect and engage, creating a safe, trauma-informed, strength-based environment where individuals feel empowered to share their most significant and sacred experiences. All of your books and articles are going to talk about empathy being at the core of the therapeutic relationship, and it is. But I also want you to be aware of some of the drawbacks of being highly empathetic in your daily relationships. The first one being emotional exhaustion. So highly empathetic individuals may absorb and internalize the emotions of others, leading to emotional fatigue and burnout, especially when dealing with distressing or challenging situations. Constant exposure to emotional struggles of others can increase stress levels. High empathetic individuals may find it challenging to detach emotionally from the difficulties faced by those around them, impacting their own well-being. And this might lead to something called compassion fatigue. So this is continuously experiencing the pain and suffering of others, and it can lead to compassion fatigue or a state of emotional and physical exhaustion that diminishes one's ability to empathize effectively. So if you're noticing that you're not able to empathize anymore, you might be in compassion compassion fatigue. And also comes with it is difficulty making tough decisions. So high levels of empathy might make it challenging to make tough decisions that involve potentially hurting someone's feelings or causing discomfort, as the empathetic individual might be overly concerned about their impact on others. High levels of empathy might also come with boundary issues. So excessive empathy might resolve in difficulty establishing and maintaining emotional boundaries. This can lead to blurring of personal and professional boundaries, making it challenging to separate one's emotions from those of others. And this is also called over-identification. So being too empathetic may result in over-identifying with others' emotions, potentially clouding judgment or hindering objectivity in certain situations. And lastly, we're going to talk a lot more about self-care today, but high empathy might come with neglecting your own self-care. So individuals with high empathy often prioritize the needs of others over their own, sometimes neglecting their own self-care, and this can lead to physical and emotional exhaustion over time and burnout. We've discussed the concept of value clarification for individuals in substance use treatment. Now let's explore on a personal dimension. What do you value most? As we engage in discussions about our personal vocational journey and the quest to embrace our true selves, it's crucial to reflect on the reasons that led us into the field of counseling, especially in addiction counseling. Consideration of our own values becomes paramount. In this context, it's essential to identify two to three core values that not only resonate in our personal lives, but also aligns with our professional endeavors. These core values serve as guiding principles representing what we hold most significant. Take a moment to review your list of values. Can you narrow it down to two or three that you consider your core values, the bedrock of your beliefs and convictions? Living our values entails more than just acknowledging them and involves putting them into practice consistently. We must walk the walk, ensuring that our words, thoughts, and behaviors align harmoniously with our identified values. 
Clarity and intentionality are crucial in this pursuit. Living in integrity becomes a daily commitment as we strive to uphold our values in both our personal and professional lives. You can only take your clients as far as you've gone yourself, meaning that if we're not living in integrity, how can we expect our clients to do so? Here, I'm going to invite you into an experiential learning activity, so that's learning by doing. While the same conversation I'm leading you in can be applied to your clients, I want you to focus on answering these questions for yourself. Feel free to journal about these or add your answers to the discussion, but first we're going to identify your core value. So explore the significant values that you have. How does that connect to you in the workplace, in the field of addiction counseling? How does it connect to you spiritually? There's no right or wrong answer here, but take some time to come up with what that value might be for you. And it's okay if it's not the same top value that you had a year ago or a decade ago, or even at the beginning of the semester. Value priorities can change over time, but right now, what's standing out for you? And once you've identified it, what are three behaviors that support your value? What are three slippery behaviors that are outside of your value? What triggers you to go in a different direction or might tempt you to act outside of your value? What's an example of a time when you were fully living into the value that you've identified? What was that like? What did it feel like physically, emotionally, spiritually? And is that feeling something that you can carry with you? Especially when time gets really hard, maybe you have a really challenging day at work, can you go back to that feeling and remind yourself why you're doing what you're doing? And lastly, who's someone who knows your values and supports your efforts to live them? They can offer you support when others might not be able to understand. So once you've answered all of these questions for yourself, you can take a moment to pause and reflect on this process. What was it like for you? Was it easy? Was it difficult? What does this say about your integrity? What did you need to do to feel better or to maintain the same feeling that you have now? So as we're talking about personal values, I'd like to take a moment to talk about field values. As addiction counselors, we need to be brave. In our line of work, we encounter both challenging tasks and individuals, and it requires us to choose courage and integrity consistently, be brave, establish clear boundaries, and do so early and consistently. Expect tests, and when faced with difficult situations, lean into them. Engage in challenging conversations with empathy and authenticity. It's crucial to talk to people not to them or about them. Maintain mindfulness, recognizing that not all people adhere to professional standards at all times. In casual settings like around the water cooler or in the break room, be the person who redirects discussions about clients to confidential spaces, reinforcing the importance of maintaining professional standards and not gossiping about clients. Let your actions speak volumes about your commitment to ethical practice. We want to serve the work. So work is not primarily a thing that one does to live, but the thing that one lives to do, or it should be maybe the full expression of the worker's abilities and the thing which you find spiritually, mentally, and physically satisfactory, or the medium in which you offer yourself to. So take responsibility for our community and for our clients' experiences. Have a say, have a voice, be a participant within the community. Take responsibility for the energy that you bring. Be a part of the solution and not a problem. There have been a number of times that I've heard many complaints in the field, especially as a supervisor, but when I ask people, do you have solutions to the problem that you're bringing to the table, they often don't find a way to be responsible for their own energy. My boss, he has a rule he likes to call the Disney rule, and I don't know how true this actually is about Disney, but I like the sentiment. So he says that Disney as a corporation doesn't permit employees to make complaints or point out problems unless they have a solution in mind. So I like this. If you're complaining about something, also bring an idea to the table. Bring some responsibility to the solution. In our involving and ever-changing field, adaptability is paramount. Every individual brings a unique experience shaping their significant story in addiction counseling. To best address client needs and our own, we must remain flexible and attentive. Taking good care involves treating others with respect and responding professionally and promptly. Pay attention to your communication, whether through emails or face-to-face interactions. Assess your tone, ensuring it aligns with the situation rather than your mood. And setting boundaries is crucial. Acknowledge individuals at your door, but recognize when it's necessary to prioritize your own tasks. 
politely express the need for a few minutes to focus before giving your full attention and practice gratitude for the privilege of impacting lives daily. It will serve you well. Being mindful of others' time is a mark of respect. Recognize that everyone has busy schedules, including those coming into our care. If there's a delay, communicate understanding and share any pertinent information. Let's uphold a culture of respect and understanding in our interactions, acknowledging the value of everyone's time and commitment. Regret is a natural aspect of our work, and it's crucial to acknowledge its presence. It's normal to encounter moments of regret in the field, whether related to clients, families, or coworkers. However, what's not healthy is avoiding discussions about these regrets or fixating on what could have been done differently. When regret arises, it's essential not to ruminate endlessly. Instead, consider addressing them constructively. Engage in conversation with others, learn from these experiences, and adapt in a way that aligns with your core values. Moving outside of these values can impact your physical and emotional well-being. Regrets left unattended can undermine resilience and contribute to burnout. To prevent regrets from growing, seek supervision and consultation. Reflect on the nature of your regrets, what they are, how often they occur, and whether you're taking actionable steps to address them. Research indicates that people often experience more regret over actions in the short term, but as they age, regrets of inaction become more prominent. To be effective change leaders, we must address our regrets proactively. This involves tending to our self-care, managing our values, and learning from our experiences to foster personal and professional growth. In the reading materials page of this week's module, I've linked an article that talks about Gestalt therapy, and you might remember talking about Gestalt from your theories class. It's one of those humanistic approaches like person-centered, but it's rooted in experiential activities or experiences to build awareness. And the whole idea is with awareness comes choice, and with choice comes the possibility for change. So there's many benefits to using Gestalt with clients, and this approach can often match with motivational interviewing techniques well, especially when we're looking at building awareness around ambivalence. But I wanted to talk to you about right now is the gestalt cycle of awareness, cycle of experience, or cycle of contact. You might be, hear it being referred to as many things, but on this slide, I've linked the cycle. So this model represents the fluid, nonlinear process through which we continuously interact with our environment, our experiences, ourselves, and other people, addressing needs as they arise. And it's made up of seven stages that we pass through in order to satisfy a need. The first being sensation and then awareness or recognition, then mobilization, action, contact, satisfaction, withdrawal. And the phase between these sensations is known in Gestalt therapy as the fertile void, since there's so much possibility that lies in that moment. And so you have to know a little bit about each stage to get to my main point about self-care. So very quickly, I'll just run through them. So sensation. In this stage, it marks the beginning of the cycle. Here, individuals encounter raw, unfiltered stimuli from their environment, triggering a preliminary recognition of potential need or desire. This might manifest physically, such as a feeling of being thirsty or hungry, or emotionally, such as a sense of loneliness, or cognitively, for instance, curiosity about a particular topic. Awareness is the stimuli intensify. Individuals progress to the stage of awareness or recognition. This transition involves processing the sensation and understanding its implications. It's at this point that a vague sensation such as discomfort crystallizes into a clearer need or desire. For instance, recognizing that that discomfort is the feeling of being hungry. Mobilization is having recognized a need or desire. Individuals will then prepare to address it. So this mobilization might involve a physical preparation like looking for food when hungry or cognitive ones such as planning a conversation when feeling challenged by a colleague or emotional ones like mentally preparing to explore a challenging topic. And then after mobilization, action is the steps needed to meet the identified need or desire. So this stage encompasses a range of potential actions tailored to the specific need at hand. So from deciding what to eat to address hunger, like an apple or an entire pumpkin pie will satiate hunger. So what will I choose to eat? Action might also look like initiating a conversation to alleviate loneliness or researching a challenging topic contact. So this is where I'm going to circle back to in a second. So just keep this idea of contact in the forefront of your mind. This stage denotes an actual meeting of the need. It represents the moment of connection between the individual and their environment, leading to satisfaction of the identified need or desire. 
And satisfaction happens post-contact. Individuals experience a sense of satisfaction or relief. Having addressed their need or desire, they often feel a sense of accomplishment, contentment, or relaxation. So just imagine, you know, if you've ever had to like pee really, really bad, you feel discomfort and then you start to recognize, oh, it's because I need to pee. And then you find a bathroom, you take a pee, whoa that relief that comes after. That's the satisfaction that I'm talking about. And then withdrawal. Finally, after the satisfaction or the need or desire has been met, individuals withdraw, returning to the state of relative equilibrium. This stage offers an opportunity for rest and reflection before the cycle recommences with a new sensation. And in between all of that, after withdrawal and before sensation is that fertile void. So the gestalt idea of unfinished business usually describes when a person has not completed this cycle. They've interrupted themselves at some point, and you often might find that people tend to interrupt themselves at the same point in the cycle over and over for different experiences. So for instance, my dear sweet husband has a lovely touch of ADHD, and he is great all the way through mobilization and just into action but he will interrupt himself before he actually makes contact and will flit his little ADHD butterfly wings onto the next bright and shiny new project. So here's where I get into the fun stuff. There's a video linked below from Glennon Doyle that she recorded at the very beginning of the pandemic as she starts to explore this idea of self-care and taking care of self. She brings up some really great points about self-care not being painting your nails or going shopping. She uses the metaphor of the easy button and how often we hit the easy button to stop ourselves out of being truly present for ourselves or really making contact with our inner selves. We like to abandon ourselves when things get messy. This idea of making contact sticking with yourselves, your emotion, building awareness around it. Where do you feel it in your body? What do you notice about your breathing or your posture when you're feeling? Sticking with yourself and not trying to change anything, just pay attention. The feeling will pass, but can you stay present with yourself long enough to get to satisfaction? If I had to point out one thing about the self-care industry, it's this. It's this Built out of avoidance and not awareness. True self-care is moving through contact into satisfaction and withdrawal, completing that cycle and moving into fertile void. Otherwise, your unfinished business will come back to haunt you. So this is my soapbox about self-care. Watch that Glennon Doyle video. Think about your patterns and how you interrupt and avoid your way out of discomfort and thus interrupt and avoid your way out of actual self-care. So achieving mastery in our field requires ongoing feedback and mentorship. Identify a mentor who can guide you on your journey, recognizing that your journey and goals and values may evolve over time. Reflect on past mentors and consider what made them significant in your professional growth. Actively seek new mentors to support your work in addiction counseling. And participating in a peer supervision group provides strength through collective insights. Embrace teamwork, fostering open conversations about values, and addressing regrets. Interdisciplinary teaming is vital. Collaborate with your colleagues, brainstorm ideas, stay informed about trends and client needs. Identify your own core values and remain true to them, understanding your triggers and what might lead you astray. Communicate openly with others about these challenges. Practice expressive writing as a means of self-reflection and a way to create and stick with contact with your experiences. Engage in regular supervision and consultation, recognizing that meaningful and intentional time should be carved out for this purpose. Embrace curiosity, vulnerability, and courage in your professional journey. Take action, speak up when necessary, and prioritize the well-being of others and yourself. Be a change leader integrating change management into your professional identity. And circling back to a Brene Brown quote, integrity is choosing courage over comfort. It's what's right over what's fun, fast, or easy, and it's practicing your values, not just professing them. So our last discussion of the lecture and of this course is how will you endorse change leadership by demonstrating integrity and courage in addiction counseling?
As we conclude this course on addiction counseling techniques, my sincere hope is that you've acquired a rich reservoir of knowledge that you can pull from in your careers. These fundamental principles are invaluable tools as you progress and evolve in your journey as a professional in addiction counseling. Your dedication, patience, and commitment to this work have not gone unnoticed, and for that, I extend my heartfelt appreciation. If there are ever any questions, comments, or concerns on your part, please feel free to reach out and ask. Thank you once again for your time, and I wish you the very best in your future endeavors in the field of addiction counseling. I hope to see you out there.